This isn't your grandma's cancer show. Not your grandma's cancer show. Hi, I'm Tatum Duroc, and this is the third in our three-part series about menopause, especially for those of us who can't have HRT. But the information from today is going to be good for all of us going through hormonal turbulence. And I have the lovely Dr. Jane Davis here with me today. We're going to talk about why menopause can bring with it so much chaos. And I've got questions from the Shine community, and it's all about weight and sex and brain fog. There's so much to cover today. So we're going to jump right in. And Dr. Jane Davis, can I ask you, like, what got you into working in menopause? Oh, that's a good question. So I'm a GP by trade. I qualified back in the millennium. So I've been doing this a little while now. And it became really obvious really early on that the way I could be most useful was by getting really good at women's health because back in the day there weren't masses of female GPs and women tended to want to see women about women's things. I also found it absolutely fascinating because I was amazed at how unwell people felt yeah. and it was driven by their hormones. And suddenly there were all these women who were just doing brilliantly and then they got completely sideswiped by something to do with hormones. You know, pregnancy periods, PMS, and then menopause and postmenopause. So it became clear to me that's what I needed to get really good at to be most useful and is absolutely fascinating. Yeah. And and you've also worked in sexual health as well. I have. I've done that for years and that's great fun. It's one of my favourite jobs because generally there's a lot of laughter in those clinics. Mm -hmm. Not always, but usually it's quite lighthearted and we have a good time and I've got lovely nurses that I work with and uh, and it's just great. I see lots of people from all ages, uh, but I particularly enjoy um, seeing young people in clinic. I work for Brooke, which is a young people service. Well, I think that's the thing, right, is that for a lot of the people listening to this is that they're going through menopause at this time in their life when this wouldn't be even on the cards, maybe for another couple of decades and friends don't understand and, you know, it can you can look OK, you know, like even with going through cancer treatment and people think that somehow the menopause isn't going to affect you as much. But what's been your experience of seeing young people in men- menopause? I think there's a lot of um, perhaps feeling embarrassed. Mm because it's a time generally in your life where people are you know t- tip top with hormones and they're you know they're feeling really sexual and they're feeling amazing and they're having a wonderful time and to not have that side of you fully functioning like people who might be a similar age but haven't been through that I think is very very hard for many. Yeah. I remember when I was a teenager reading Cosmo that men hit their sexual peak at 18 and women at 38. No idea if that's true, but it sunk into my mind that like the best was coming. And anytime my sex was, you know, substandard or a partner wasn't that great, I was like, you know what? There's more to come. There's more to come. And like my whole sex life was about this magical 38 peak that was coming. And then I had my ovaries removed at 36. And this fantasy, and I know it was a projection as well, of this sexual liberation that was going to happen, these sort of multiple orgasmic era of my life was whipped away. Um, Is it true that women have a sexual peak? Well, I think your illustration of that article from Cosmo is a brilliant one. And thank you for sharing it so openly because I'm sure it's familiar to lots of people listening. And I was certainly a huge fan of Cosmo (laughs) in my 20s. I loved it. Uh, I still do, actually. I still dip in to make sure I'm still still understanding what everyone's wanting these days from their sexual health. So so I I would say that that will be based on some research somewhere, that age, age, but it's, it's incredibly individual. 
because sexual peak is to do with so many different things. As you say, Tatum, you may have reached your sexual peak in your 20s. You just didn't have the right partner to help you reach it. <laughs> so there could have been many factors involved there. Couldn't yeah, there? well, I didn't know I was gay for a while, so I was... <laughs> I was swimming in the wrong pond for a bit. <laughs> so, yes, there are many complications that come come with life. Um, one of the things that especially comes up in our community is between having either cancer side effects treatment is how do we know when we're in menopause? And one of the questions that I got, which was a very specific question, and I know you can't answer you know, specific questions, but this kind of illustrates the complexity of what happens is that um, one person from Shine said, I have PCOS. I never started having periods. I'm now on a drug for endometrial cancer. Will I go through the menopause? Um, and so when people have had their wombs taken out and they've been radiated and things have happened where, you know, the normal sequence of having periods and then them going, the, the indicators of menopause aren't there. How, how do you know? Again, you're going to hear me say this a lot. It's, it's individual. So some women may be very in tune with their bodies and know that something has changed either slowly through recovery from what they've been through or suddenly because of the treatment that they've had. Other people might find that they, like your lady that um, that, that emailed in, she didn't ever really understand what she felt like with cyclical activity. And by that, I mean the hormones going up and down in that wave that's driven by ovulation, where you f most people feel great mid-cycle and want to have sex. And most people feel really you know, are grumpy and have sore boobs and don't feel great just before their periods. But some women won't have even got to know that before they hit treatment for various reasons. So being guided by your symptoms may be really easy for some women and really difficult for others. And what symptoms would you recommend looking for? So the classic one of hot flushes. So that's been around for years and years and years. And years. Everyone's talked about that associated with menopause. So in some ways, that's an easy one to spot because although there are conditions that cause hot flushes and they would always need to be considered, particularly for people who've got very complex histories, uh, the, it's very likely that right up at the top of a diagnostic list for a clinician is going to be some sort of hormonal imbalance. So, and hot flushes, again, they're not the same for everybody. Some people describe a heat coming up from their toes that just sort of builds and builds and then it's like a volcano. Other people get just sweaty. Other people get their heart racing and get hot. Other people just get a little bit red around their necks. Mm -hmm. Some people feel like their feet are on fire. I love that one. Um, so everybody's got their own version of it. So if there's something weird going on with your third thermostats and sometimes it's even if you've gone really cold yeah. rather than really hot then that's something really important to pay attention to because it may be hormonal it might be something else so I'd say look out for that one because that's a that's a really firm indicator that something's out of whack in your body. Yeah no one ever talks about the cold do they mm. like, and that cold it's like for me, it was cold in my bones. So I could even put like a, you know, a hot water bottle on me and it wouldn't touch the coldness because the coldness was so deep inside and like even movement or, you know, wouldn't like shake it. Um, and it was just an impossible position where I'd feel like completely wanting to curl up into myself um, and just wait until it was over <laughs> and a hot flush would come along and then I could kind of get back into doing whatever I was doing. Um, but yeah, it's something that no one ever talks about, the, the range of, of flushes. And as you were saying, like thinking of it like your internal thermostat, I think is really handy. Yeah, absolutely. And thinking if you think something's not right, then then seek some help about it yeah. because that that's that's what this is all about because hormones affect everybody in their own unique pattern 
So if you're sensing something isn't right, most of the time women are able to have a feeling about whether it's a hormonal thing or not. Sometimes mm-hmm. they can't, but it, it, you know that that's the time to say, look, this isn't right for me. Could it be hormones and bounce it off somebody? Yeah, I know that mine. So I I went through three menopauses and they were all quite different to one another. Mm. Um, one was treatment. One was um, surgically removing um, my ovaries, and the third one was after I was pregnant and um, lost the pregnancy and went from pregnant into postmenopause. So that was my last one. So I know from myself how varied those flushes can be, and some of them are like a panic attack. You know, I'll be in the supermarket, like freaking out about what kind of cauliflower to buy, you know, as if it's it's th- this all consuming you know, thing. If I get the wrong one, the world is going to open up and it's like just impending doom. And then you feel the heat and you're like, oh, yeah. And then you have to march over to the freezing freezer department to <laughs> stick your head in something. Um, so yes, yeah, so some of them can really come with like emotions as well, like anxiety or doom. Or are there any other physical sensations in the body that you know of that come along with? So that that sense of anxiety that that often comes, and particularly early in the morning, so that, that early morning, three or four in the morning is a classical time because sometimes um, you, you get hot, you wake up and then the adrenaline surges and then the first thing most people do is attach, why am I, I, I must be feeling like this because I've got something to worry about and then they hook it onto something and off they go ruminating about what they're worrying about. Of course, a lot of us do have a lot to worry about, but actually often it's a physiological thing that's woken you up. So palpitations, internal thermostat going wonky, adrenaline levels sky high. Mm. That's part of it. Yeah. Okay, that's really good to know. And we've got um, a question from one of our Shine members. Her name is Af. Are there any vitamins and minerals or supplements that you could recommend that you feel are beneficial to someone going through menopause or managing menopause or symptoms? So my short answer is please don't bankrupt yourselves on supplements because the problem is that they're not... Uh, very well regulated or very well researched. So it breaks my heart when people spend lots and lots and lots of money on things that they're putting in their bath or, um, you know, or, or taking vast quantities, but actually there's no science. And the reason for that is because I'm a doctor and I'm taught to practice medical evidence based medicine. So I can't allow people to do that with my blessing. However, there are some common sense things to think about. So B6 is good for mood and we've got some reasonable evidence about that. So go for it with the B vitamins. And I believe that it's better to take them in a complex than it is to take it alone. But the B6 is the bit that does the job. Um, So that's worth it. And a general supplement is worth thinking about, but not anything expensive. Is B um, vitamins, are they in foods as well? Is there a certain type of food that would give you B6? They are, but to be honest, I would say if you're specifically wanting to go for something, B, B supplements don't cost a lot of money and okay. I'll just make sure you've got that really. Yeah. Bearing in mind I'm a GP and I'm used to di- dishing out medicines rather than nutritional information. <laughs> um, I, I would say, cut, you know, cut, cut, cut yourself some slack and just get some of that and wash it down with an ice cream or something personally. Um so that's that's a good one. Having a general multi that's worth the, worth thinking about, but again, don't go for something really complex and expensive. And it, it, there is reasonable evidence to say that we don't get enough vitamin D in mm. the winter months, even after amazing summer like we've had. Um, it's really worth thinking about a vitamin D supplement. And again, you can just pick it up for pence from the supermarket. So if you've got those in your cupboard, I think that's a reasonable start. But I wouldn't go crazy on anything else personally. Yeah, because you hear about like, I mean, black cohash was one of the ones that was being thrown around a lot. And when I was in the um, 
in, you know, like a Hollands and Barrett or something, it would be like balancing your hormones. And I was like, yeah, but I don't have any. <laughs> like, how is it balancing? Like, would any of this possibly work? Um you know, if you don't have any ovaries at all or you have zero function happening, which is a bit different than when someone is, you know, going through a period of time where their hormones are maybe settling down like in a natural flow. Would that be the right thinking or what would you say to things like that? I think it's, I would say that in terms of the storm that goes on in the body when it goes through menopause, there is nothing that's going to settle it. The most amazing vitamin in the world is not going to do it. And neither is HRT, okay, guys? So don't feel too left out of this because what's going on in the body is a seismic shift. And all we can do is support your body whilst this shift happens. The, the real work, the, the real stuff that works is all the lifestyle changes, really looking after yourself with eating as well as you can afford to do and sleeping as much as you know you need to do and not getting yourself stressed out and doing all those other things. That will do the large chunk of whatever it is you need to do. The supplements, the HRT, the whatever other medicines that we can prescribe for you are going to do a bit Okay. Okay. So it's a little bit like a jigsaw is what mm -hmm. I'm imagining. So you have this this picture of um, everything that's going on in your body and the emotional component of menopause and the mental component. We're going to go, I've got more questions about that as well. Um, and it's thinking about how to, yeah, I like how you put that, like supporting your body as it's dealing with this. And even if you were to have HRT, you would still need to do this as well um, to get the best out of the situation that, you know. Yeah, 100%. So there is no magic bullet for this situation. So it must be so hard for women to hear about how marvellous all these menopausal women yeah. feel on their HRT yeah. and how they must be having the most mind-blowing sex and how their minds must be so switched on by all this HRT <laughs> that they feel like they could do a crossword in about two seconds <laughs> and manage their WhatsApp chats at 150 miles an hour. But do you know what? It's not true. True. It's true for some who are feeling amazing, but the majority of people are having a rough time and they might be on HRT and be feeling slightly less rough. But I also know people who are on HRT who are still having a rough time. So it's I think it's trying to listen to all of that and trying to find the reality in all of these stories that are there. Because I promise you, having done this for lots of years as a doctor, I know plenty of people who have got all the best treatments in the world at their fingertips and are still having a rough time. Yeah. And it's the people that get really get the hang of the fact they've really got to just reevaluate everything and really look after themselves. They're the ones that make the progress. Mm. That's really interesting because it's... Yeah, and and as we're going through this today, we're we're going to be putting together bits of this jigsaw and kind of you know thinking about things that you know might resonate with you that you might be able to incorporate into your life and not be too overwhelmed by, because I think that's that's part of menopause, right? Is everything can be really overwhelming, um, and kind of thinking about it in bite-sized pieces. And I know for me as well, one of the things that was really useful was knowing why I was in the mood I was in or why I was so tired um, because then I was able to give myself more of a break whereas when you're pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing you often end up in you know compounding the stress of it and you know, stress seems to make all the symptoms worse. It does, absolutely. I think that's that's really, really good. It's noting it, it's acknowledging it, it's giving yourself permission to, to manage this. Like, this is a thing, I'm experiencing this thing and therefore I need to manage this in a different way, yeah. not just ploughing through. Yeah. So I have, um, I've got a question from someone that said, I feel like I'm going insane. I do meditations, exercise, eating well, also sleep. How do I get sleep again? So 
I really feel like the, the first part of that, I feel like I'm going insane. How often do you hear that? So, so often. Um, it's it, it, People really worry about it. It seems the cognitive side, that brain foggy bit, the bit where you can't concentrate, the bits where words disappear, the, um, you know, the, the, outrageous mood swings i think some somebody one of your listeners described themselves as godzilla didn't they yeah they changed they. their mood i thought that was brilliant because <laughs> it's that mo- one minute you're okay and the next minute you're completely off the scale and it, it's those things that would not it would not surprise me at all that somebody might feel like they were losing their mind and people often come and tell me about they 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 come in thinking that they need a brain scan because they think they've got dementia because they can't remember names they can't sequence things people who've done the same job for years uh, or who are really good at something um who suddenly can't do it so you know younger people for example who are doing postgrad stuff and all of a sudden they can't do it anymore and they've obviously got to postgrad so they must be quite clever um but their hormones just derail them yeah And that is one of, it's one of those things, I I think the thing that I heard when I was working with you in the in the menopause um, online clinics was, I don't feel like myself anymore. And that is so foundational, isn't it? To like everything that we build, build from, like that's, that's the bottom that we're, we're putting everything into. And that feeling of like your brain not working in the same way that it did before does seem to really speak to that. Is there anything that you know that can be useful for dealing with that level of brain fog? Or I feel like there should also be another name for it. Um, Because of course you've got, you know, chemo brain and you've got, um, you know, brain fog. But I also think that the menopausal haze um, even encompasses even more. Yeah, absolutely. And there isn't a name for it. And there's very little research there. The, 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 the research that is coming out is new and exciting, but don't get too hung up on it. So I, that's a really good dipstick of the fact that it's no wonder we haven't got a name because we haven't actually got a thing. We don't know what this thing is yet. We just know there's a lot of people feeling rubbish in various different patterns, but no one's pulled it all together yet and brain fog seems to have been a a, a phrase that's that's really taken off um, and of course as medics we've got the very catchy cognitive difficulties mm-hmm. don't think that's going to take off is it <laughs> no. so yeah maybe your listeners come up with something for us because it would be great to have a user-friendly name for what it is people are experiencing um, but you're asking me whether there's a solution for it I wish there was a magic bullet and I have to tell you Everyone who thinks that testosterone is going to do it for them, they, they, they're they then barking up the wrong tree at this stage. So any of you who've listened to that and thought, oh, it's awful, I can't have testosterone because I can't have amazing sex, I'm not going to feel really clever because I can't have testosterone, don't worry, nobody else is either. Um, so that bit is in development. People are excited about it, but we don't know a lot about it. So I just thought I'd mention that because it's a watch this space. Yeah. It's not a it's not that everyone else is having it and feeling amazing on it thing. It's something everyone's got really excited about. This the science isn't quite there. That's I know. certainly about the cognitive side. When I first heard about testosterone, I was like, ooh, that's not estrogen. Maybe I can have that. You know, and I think a lot of people with estrogen positive cancers, you know, when they first hear that, like, ooh, is that something? And Then I found out that it turns into estrogen in the body if you have low estrogen. So, yeah, if you can't have estrogen, they're not going to give you testosterone, are they? It essentially it's, it is quite complex and it is an exciting field, but we don't know enough yet, and we're certainly not in a position to be able to know what, how it would behave in people who've had hormone sensitive cancers. So it's a not it's not a no never. It's a let's see what the next few years brings with it, and I genuinely don't know which way it will go at the moment. But I have had patients coming in, having seen documentaries and yep. being excited and just like you, Tate, and they're like, yes, I can, you know, I, I, I've dealt with the flushes, I've done it my own way, but this is something I want. Mm-hmm. And why wouldn't they? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm hoping 
you know, now that it, it seems like everyone's talking about menopause everywhere and like you go into boots now and everything's targeting menopause at you, like all these different products and stuff, um, like you, you're you hoping that that means there will be more research on on the horizon that, you know, women are really asking for this now because it does seem to be somewhat neglected for a very long time would that would that correlate with your experience yeah totally when i when i started doing menopause it was a sort of strange fringy thing to do and people thought you were a bit odd and a bit of a lone wolf and you'd go to these tiny little conferences with hardly anybody there even when they were you know people all over the the world and then these it, it's just it's absolutely huge now and everyone understands what you mean and with that comes funding for research and particularly with the brain side of things the first time I went to a, a sort of global conference I looked hard for something about brains and cognitive problems I found one lecture wow. and I listened to it so intensely because it was so exciting but can you believe a whole five-day conference with the whole world there and one lecture on the brain so that's how early all this research is and, yeah. and it will come because women's brains are incredibly important, but it's not there. So I guess what I'm saying is there isn't an evidence-based fix that's about that anybody who's listening is missing out on. It's a, it's putting that jigsaw together, like we've said before. And there is good research being done on cognition, uh, particularly in the US. And what they're finding out, even when they're putting HRT into the mix, is they're saying the most powerful things are getting the sleep right, turning off the flushes, winding down that stress so keeping cortisol levels down and looking after general health as well because not smoking and drinking either nothing or a little amount actually does a lot for your blood vessels and blood vessels are important for brains so there's a it's back to the same picture it's i wish i could say that it's all about having a brilliant time and going clubbing and staying up all the time and living a fast life but unfortunately yes please do that because it's really important to have fun um, but a lot of it's all to do with looking after you uh, so that you can go off and have that fun and yeah. then come back and be well. So what about antidepressants? Because I feel like um, they get offered to people a lot and there is um, a sense of, you know, I've heard many women sort of say, well, I, it's hormonal. It's not, I'm not depressed. Um and feel like they're being given the wrong thing. But on the other hand, some antidepressants can actually help with some menopausal symptoms. Is is that what you're finding? Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Don't rule out antidepressants, but also don't think of them as antidepressants. Um, they are really clever brain drugs that do really clever things. And some of what they do is to do with brain chemistry stabilization. And some of it's to do with the way that works with hormones interestingly. So it's not, um, it, it, when when people are feeling fobbed off because they've been offered antidepressants, um, it's, I, I think they, sh they, they shouldn't, if they understood a little bit more about how clever these drugs are, they would probably feel like they could use that as a tool to help them. And, and what I do, and I know lots of other doctors who do menopause stuff do this is we use antidepressant drugs but we use them in much smaller doses mm. than they would be if they were antidepressants more as a brain chemistry stabilizer and they do brilliant work on stopping flushes so they're definitely my go-to for flushes for someone who can't take hormones they're great for that awful edgy anxiety feeling that people have but i don't want to give them so much that it's going to smash up their libido and make right. them feel rubbish i want to just give them a sniff of it <laughs> so that they feel stable but not squashed i That's love that different yeah because so i was i'm i'm gonna pronounce it wrong venlafaxane mm -hmm. or something something like that i was given that and it changed my life. Like for the first time I was able to sleep in 10 years. Prior to that, it was just one long day is how I describe it. So I'd wake up in the morning feeling just as tired as the night before. And even if I got sleep, it was never rejuvenative sleep. It was never like a deep rest. 
And whether or not that was because I was micro awakening all through the night with flushes and never actually getting into that deep, deep state, which I know is a form of insomnia, um, because there's like four different types of insomnia, um, learning about that. Um, So, but when I was given it and I was given it at a really low dose and I slept and it was like this heavy blanket of comfort that just like rolled like a wave over me and I hadn't touched that in so long and it meant that then I had more energy and then from that energy I felt like I could write more lists (laughs) so I could sort of manage my brain fog and then from there I could start to address some of the other things of looking after myself because I felt like I actually had a resource for the first time Um, and I need to track down my GP um, because it was someone I didn't normally see because I want to say thank you to her for literally it changed my life Um, and it's at such a low dose but when I went up a dose um, I started to not feel like me so it was more than a sniff and that that made me feel flat and like you know and I know everyone is so different when it comes to this and the dosing and everything so how long do you recommend if someone is given an antidepressant to help them with hormonal symptoms how long do you think they should be on them before they go "Mm, I think I want a bit more or a bit less you won't be surprised that I'm going to say this is individual (laughs) because (laughs) because I know some ladies that use um antidepressants, the SSRI ones, so things like sertraline, if you've heard of that, they use those just in, who are having awful premenstrual symptoms, Mm -hmm. they use it just for seven days around the period and it doesn't work like an antidepressant, it works as a stabiliser. So some people, they can just use it like that and feel good. Interesting. So it so it depends on how you're doing. I think it's taking note of what's working and what's not working mm-hmm. and, and then being able to build on that because you want more of what's working and less of what's not. And it, working with a good clinician like the GP you saw is, is gold dust I and mean, you just need somebody like this. That's what I wish for all of your listeners, that you find a clinician who can really hear what you're saying and can really go the extra mile for you and you know if you come in with ideas that they can say great I don't know about that but I'll find out or I'll ask a colleague and come back and we'll work together because it's all about taking apart each of these symptoms that are related to menopause and we can do something about each thing separately it's just we haven't got a magic bullet that does the lot. Mm. Yeah so it's like maybe picking which things are like most in the forefront of your mind or you know the most the the, the biggest impediment to your um life cuz you know we were talking um on a previous episode about how you know sometimes it can be just make life really hard and other times it can be disabling it can be the difference between working or not working. It can be the difference between going out and getting the shopping and being at home with chronic fatigue. Like it can, you know, the impact is not to be underestimated. Are there any examples of people that you've seen where the impact of menopause has been quite quite extreme? So not, n- not something that everyone would experience, but kind of at the further end of the spectrum. I've certainly seen a lot of people you know ticking all those boxes you've just described those 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 images people who are at home people that can't work people that can't do the things they want to do and it's even more dramatic when you're young because you want to be out kicking the world to bits don't you not disabled by something like Mm -hmm. this so yeah i think those are all very good very good illustrations yeah so I have a question from mm-hmm. Abby, who is on mm-hmm. um, the first of our series of three um, podcasts, and um, she was talking about her relationship with her husband, and we have her question. I just explained to him that it hurt too much. I have no inclination for it. I don't seem to get that desire anymore. How often do you hear that? Oh, a lot, so much. And it's it's such a distressing symptom when 
the sex drive goes and sex hurts. I mean, what could be worse for a young person? Yeah. That's really hard. Yeah, I was reading through, Shine did a, um, a sex survey and actually menopause mm. featured on it quite a bit. And there was a lot of things in there that like, they could have come out of my head. Like I recognized them with that, you know, oh wow, like that was what was in my head, but I never told anyone. And I feel like it's really useful to know that you're not alone in feeling broken, in feeling... Um, you know, kind of unlovable um, or feeling that you have to go through with the pain. Um, but at the same time, you know, you can feel that way, but anyone on the outside is like, oh, like you would want to help and would never want you to feel those things, especially shame, especially embarrassment um, and especially pain. When someone comes to you with, this and you know i i know abby's very happy with her husband um what what is your advice where do you even begin to deal with it so so somebody's coming in uh, or you know picking up the phone or emailing or something about it that's amazing because for every one person that's actually reaching out there are so many that are keeping this secret yeah and I know this from working in rural communities where I will see people um, who are all having sexual difficulties for various reasons. And they turn out that they're neighbours or they all live in the same village and they're not talking to each other about it. They're all keeping it secret and they're all feeling dreadful and isolated and lonely. Mm. So there's something there about getting um, breaking that taboo and getting the conversation going and reaching out to each other anonymously if that feels better or to a friend or something like that but so if someone's reaching out to a clinician I'm 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 already optimistic that we're going to be able to do something to help because they've already identified there's a problem they've already thought I'm going to do something about this so they've got a goal in mind um, and some people will come and say there's a problem I need you to fix it some people will say this thing is going on you know it so it depends what they're coming with and what they need but someone who's talking about sex being painful and someone who's talking about just not wanting to have sex at all that's very very common like Abby's described so I've got a way of unpicking it um would you like to hear? Yes, yes, I would, <laughs> definitely. So you used jigsaws earlier. So I was always taught to think about female sexual uh, sexuality as, as a four-piece jigsaw. Because when you can chunk it up like that, you can identify where the difficulties are and what we can do as a team to help and by that I mean me and the patient being a team because it's not me I'm not the one who's going to have to go and you know do all these things but I can help facilitate finding out what to do so so the first thing is if somebody's got a problem with their genitals if sex is hurting uh, or if if they're feeling a bit dry or a bit itchy or prickly or they've had some surgery that's changed how they feel about their genitals specifically, then there's going to be some work to do there to try and help that get right. And dryness is ever such a common problem around menopause. Um, people can get dryness even if they haven't been through menopause because they're on various contraceptives. So I think there's a lot of people with a lot of dryness that just aren't talking about it anyway. So mm -hmm. again, it's it's getting that conversation out there. So lube, lube, lube. That's my first learning point for anyone who doesn't use lube. It's a game changer. You've got to get some. Um, don't get the stuff in the supermarket. Well, you can get the stuff from the supermarket. There's base if you're using condoms, and obviously that's your best protection against STIs. You need a water-based lube, and by all means, get the stuff that's in the supermarkets. But if you're not using condoms and you want to use a slightly better lube, oil-based lubes are better. 
And if you want to do something really fun, you can mix an oil-based and a water-based and it's called a double glide. And that's a good tip. <laughs> I did not know it had a name, but I do have both of them. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I got the yes, yes, yes ones and I got the water and the oil one. Great. Yeah. They're the best product. Okay, so double for glide. Example, yeah, double glide. Go for it because it, it make, makes everything much easier. So basically, the more you can use lube and feel comfortable doing that um you know either before sex or during sex or whenever it works for you and whoever you're having sex with or if you're having sex on your own just use lube because it makes it protects that delicate skin it makes sensation better what's not to love about lube basically so that's the most important thing. If anyone goes on an after your podcast and gets themselves some lube that didn't have some before, I'll feel that we've done Excellent. a good job today. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So that yeah, really, really important. Um, other things to say are, although a lot of people listening will have very complex medical conditions and have been told they can't have hormones, there are some exceptions where vaginal estrogen is actually okay so it's worth asking the question and revisiting that no and saying is it a no for all hormones or could I have something vaginally um, because vaginal estrogens don't absorb in the same way and can be used for um, more women than you would think after cancer and that is supported um, by good evidence so I'm um, I'm not saying I'm not telling everyone listening that it's okay for them to have vaginal estrogen I'm saying please ask the question yeah. if, if you're if you think there's a that, that that's something you would consider if they said yes actually it's fine the evidence has come on since we last spoke to you and actually yes you could use some so that's worth knowing about um and then getting you know getting the the genitals more kind of in the mood is really important because some people are going to find that their sexual response is slowed down after they've had treatments um but maybe because they are they haven't got their hormones working and so there's not so much estrogen kind of getting everything going or maybe it's because they've had some chemo or radiotherapy or something that's directly affected them so anything you can do to get that going is the best way to go and don't be afraid to use things like vibrators there's amazing vibrators around these days silicon ones little bullet ones which are amazing at getting the blood flow going getting um, sensation going just generally getting your confidence back really mm -hmm. and having some fun yes you know that's I, the thing it should be fun in an area that has been painful for a long time having any pleasure is radical isn't it like mm -hmm. it that's it, it it can completely change the game, whether that's on your own, whether that's with somebody else, but actually figuring out what feels good and what felt good before might be totally different to what feels good now. I heard it ex explained as needing more input post-menopause. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like whether that be more vibration or just more stimulus, more different things happening. Um, but yeah, like knowing that maybe if... You know, you had a bit of a, a system that always worked before that actually this is this could be like a whole different um, scenario. And also orgasms can change. I mean, I remember one day working really hard <laughs> for an orgasm that was so disappointing. I mean, it was like instead of this like epic big like I was like a person that would have one big huge orgasm it, like when it finally came I was like oh god that was so not worth it <laughs> um it, it it was it was like a hiccup it was nothing um you know if there was like a drooping sound effect that's what that, <laughs> that orgasm was is that normal and can that change Yes, absolutely. Because orgasms are reflex and there's so many things that will feed into whether that reflex is at its tip top or whether it's feeling a bit, a bit droopy. So yeah, 
it doesn't mean it's here to stay. If you have droopy orgasms or no orgasms, if they've disappeared, it doesn't mean they won't come back again. So it's it's all about trying to be kind to your genitals. Again, it's all about this whole talk today is about focusing, isn't it? Identifying what the problem is and taking a step back and right, actually it is sore. So the first thing you should do with a sore thing is put something soothing on it. That's where the lube comes in. And actually using a moisturiser as well is incredibly helpful. So mm -hmm. you can use vaginal moisturisers, which you put um, into the vagina two or three times a week, and that can give just a baseline moisturiser. You can also use, um, you know, a nice thick emollient, something like this, something like Epiderm, which is cheap as chips. You can get it in the chemist and you can just put that around the outside just as a barrier and just to just generally start taking some care of your genitals because they do, they, when people will always need to take more care of their genitals as they go through their lives. They learn to do it at some point or they get very itchy and sore. And But for people who are having to learn to do that younger, it can sometimes become a, a thing they didn't know they needed to do. Mm. So it's important. Vulval skin care is really important. It's as important as what you do for your facial hair. Um, facial hair. <laughs> your facial skin. <laughs> I knew what you meant. <laughs> but yeah, that, you know, and I think also even the act of doing that is a reconnection, isn't it, with that mm -hmm. area? Because I think what happens is when your libido completely goes away, when there's pain, when there's discomfort, when it's sore, you start to almost separate from it in, in your mind. You start to maybe ignore it. Um, if someone hasn't had sex in a really long time, um, is it possible for it to come back? Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Anything is possible with the right support and the right patience. Um, it depends what kind of sex you're aiming for, really. And don't and you know, we don't we must make sure that, that everyone doesn't think penis and vagina sex is the panacea for all ills. It certainly isn't, is it? So it depends what kind of sex you want to have, really. Um, but in terms of vaginal penetration, essentially the more lubricated the more stretchy the more looked after that area can be the more likely that is to happen if that's what you're after and remember that th that fingers are much softer and bendier than penises and vibrators so start with that kind of thing first think about blood flow you can use vaginal dilators and you can even get them on prescription but you'll have a lot more fun with a soft silicon vibrator so there's lots of good places to get this kind of thing. Um, am I mad to recommend yeah, a website? Yeah, that, there's a reputable website that I would recommend called Joe Divine. And uh, and a lot of us who in the menopause world send people to that website because there's good information on there and some jolly fun toys there as well and lots of lubes and things. So that's a good start to so having a look on there. Brilliant. And you say that that even thinking about going shopping for something yeah. for sexual pleasure is therapeutic in itself, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. And, you know, switching it up, like whatever it is, your perfume, your, you know, your underwear, that, that thing that makes you feel, you know, a little bit more like yourself or, you know, music or, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that we can kind of do to get in the mood as well and kind of regain that. Um, yeah, that confidence that's really been sapped away, you know, in the kind of menopause black hole. And especially like after having cancer or still going through cancer treatment, you want when you do have energy to be able to enjoy yourself. So, you know, it's like you want it even more and doing things that remind you of yourself become even more useful during this time. Absolutely. I think that's really well said. And that, and that's that's the other bit of the jigsaw. You know, that's the where's your head at. Really, really, really important. For women, that's a huge part of our jigsaw. Yeah. Um, so genitals, head, you know, addressing those other problems that are going on, you know, whether that's balancing hormones through a, what hormones that are working through different ways or whether it's working out what the problems are without the hormones and how you can help that really really helps and then of course it's having you know having a good open dialogue with whoever it is you're having sex with if 
you are having sex with somebody just communication that's what it's all about isn't it yeah so those are those are my four bits of the jigsaw and if anyone can sit with a piece of paper and think okay what's really going on with me in sex right now Mm -hmm. and what would I really what would my goal be if I could if I could if I could feel better about sex what's one thing that would make me feel better that would be a great start I um, was dating and was really scared of bringing it up with a new partner and to the point that I was like, oh, maybe I should just bail on the second date. (laughs) Um, And weirdly enough, it turned out that she had experienced something really similar in her 20s. it's got that funny name, vaginismus. Vaginismus. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. where she hadn't been able to have penetrative sex either. And I literally thought there's no chance that I would ever, ever meet someone who would understand. And the first person, you know, post, post-divorce post um, did. Like, mm-hmm. and I, you know, I couldn't have, couldn't have imagined that. But I think as you start to be more comfortable in yourself it's really interesting then other people start to open up and will also share like maybe their challenges and you know times in their life that they haven't felt as connected to their you know parts of their body or to their sexuality or you know so it can can open some really interesting um doors uh, which if someone had told me that I'm not sure I would have believed them but it no, until it no. actually happened so it's-, it's true i totally yeah i think that's a really really good illustration of it it's it, it, as someone who's who works in sexual health who's been a gp and i'm also training in psychosexual counseling i can assure you that there are a lot of people out there having issues with sex and you're definitely not going to be alone if you're the only per- you know if you are brave enough to talk about it if you feel you can or go online about it then you will find other people who are experiencing similar things and it is really really helpful to share experiences yeah oh that's yeah that's so good so um i've got another um pre-recorded question from af can you recommend any exercise regimes where you can introduce weights into the exercise that you're already doing to help manage um pain that you get from menopausal symptoms wow so uh, some exercises if you're already doing exercise or what other exercise can you do crikey i don't know i'm not a pt instructor <laughs> i wish i wish i was i mean the general gist is as far as i can understand it she says delving into her nerdy science head is that i understand that it's it is it as, as your listeners saying it's to do with working on strength you don't need to hit the gym and be a high intensity gym bunny because actually high intensity work isn't quite as important as the slightly less intense work uh, around menopause so strength training is is really important so I wouldn't be able to recommend anything specific as a GP I direct people to NHS choices if I'm not really sure if I'm taking something outside my area of expertise but I'm sure there's plenty of other good places to go with a question like that. Yeah because I think that um, you know we hear a lot about weights because especially bone health Mm -hmm. um, and so bone health is affected by menopause is that right? Very much so yeah yeah and it's really important to look after bones because uh, because the lack of oestrogen has quite an impact on bone density. So the more weight-bearing exercise that can be done, that doesn't mean to say you've got to do weights in a gym. Weight-bearing is, is going for a walk. That's great. Um, weight-bearing is doing some gentle yoga so that your wrists get some weight through them. So it doesn't mean go crazy. You can if you like, but yeah. you, could, you can also achieve it in quite a reasonable way. And making sure there's enough calcium in your diet is super important particularly if you're plant-based because um, because that that's something to look at look it up look at what you're getting and um, making sure you've got enough vitamin D yeah coming back the to the vitamin D yeah uses calcium so make sure you get you either loads of sunshine or you 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 taking a vitamin D supplement so they're they're the important tips about bones and we've got one more question from F 
I have a potential referral to a menopause specialist at my local hospital. Are there any questions that you could recommend asking when I have this meeting? The more prepared you can be for an appointment like that, the more you'll get out of it. So um, these appointments are like gold dust and they, they suspect AFS waited a very long time for it. So it's very, very important that, that those moments in the clinic are made the most of. So take somebody along if that's possible so that anything the clinician says you can talk about it afterwards and make sure you know what 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 what's been taken away from that that you're going to put in place. Definitely make a list of questions and take it with you. And don't worry about working your way through the list because clinicians are trained in communication. We'll manage our time. You mustn't feel like you're taking up our time or you're or you're a pain or you're making other people wait or any of that. That's our problem not yours so take your list make it as long as you need it to be and work your way through it um and go back to what you're saying earlier t- taking those 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 things that are most bothersome and popping that at the top of your list things you've tried already things that you would like that consultant to help you with so what you're expecting from this so we call it in medicine we call it ideas concerns and expectations ideas means this is what this is my theory this is what i think's going on the concern is this is how it's affecting me as in um you know it hurts when i have sex and it's affecting my relationship and expectation is um what can you do can you help me you know is there something i can take can i have a prescription today or can you ask my gp that's how d- doctors think and if you can phrase each of those problems in that way you'll all be speaking the same language so Ooh. that's my inside info yeah for you. thanks no that's <laughs> really really useful because i think you know when i finally got through to the menopause clinic it took me eight years um till um, that lovely gp that i mentioned earlier um got me got me in and I was so overwhelmed. I was like, how do I even begin? Like, you know, there's so many symptoms and you you feel almost like a bit of a hypochondriac sometimes because it can affect so many different parts of your body and it might affect somewhere for a bit and then another area for another period of time. And, you know, I was sort of speeding through them and it was so lovely when the clinician was just like, she just took a breath, she just relaxed and, you know, said, yeah, keep going. And I was like, oh, my God, like, actually, that was the first time that anyone had asked me that. Like, you know, even sharing with friends, you kind of feel like you've got a time limit, right? Because especially after, like, going, you know, having cancer and treatment and everything else, and you, you feel like you're, you don't want to talk about this. You don't want to talk about things that are still you know, impeding your life um, and on top of everything else. And it was the first time that someone said, you know, keep going. And I was like, oh, and I have more, you know, (laughs) another 10 symptoms come back up. So that's really lovely, you know, what you're saying, kind of to empower people to to come with those symptoms and to express them and how important that is. Yeah. And the key is how are those symptoms impacting on your life? That's the that's yeah. the clincher for a for a clinician because that helps us work out where to pitch a management plan. And then what are you expecting? What do you want them to do for you today? And then that helps them work out whether they can meet that expectation or whether, because we want to meet your expectations. We want you to be happy. We want you to feel better when you walk out of that room. So if you tell us what it is, brilliant. Yep. Oh, thank you so much. This has just been so good to kind of think of it like a jigsaw. And then you had your four sex jigsaw points. <laughs> Can you run through those just really quickly? So there was... Um... It's it's genitals. Yeah. M- must have think of a nicer word than that <laughs> if you like, but I'm a doctor, so it's genitals. And it's where's your head at? Yeah. And it's where you are either in your relationship or that's the sort of social side of things is the mm-hmm. third bit. And then the fourth bit is is the hormonal side of things, the effects of obviously what's menop- what menopause is doing to you and breaking that down into what are the problems and what can we do about it. Yeah. 
And it really sounds like there there are things to do. And whether or not we get to have access to hormone replacement, actually, these are things that we would need to be doing anyway in terms of looking after ourselves and and that profound looking after ourselves as well, like advocating for ourselves, asking for, you know, perhaps a meeting with someone like you in a menopause clinic. And even when we're there, advocating for us and what we're going through and our symptoms um, and giving ourselves a break really as well. Just sometimes it is overwhelming and scary and disorienting and that is also part of what hormones can do. That's right. And recognising that you've been through more than what most young people go through at this stage and cutting yourself some slack that actually you still need some help and you ought to go and ask for it and keep going till you've got it. Yeah. Oh, I wish someone had told me that when I first got turned down for the menopause clinic because they said there's nothing that they can do for you. And, um, you know, I suffered with chronic fatigue and obviously not being able to sleep for years and lots of other things. And, you know, more profound brain fog, everything else, until I finally got to the menopause clinic, finally got some sleep and finally was able to get a handle and everything else. So, you know, for me, that was really, really key to know that they do have, it is still worth speaking to a menopause doctor, even if they can't give you HRT. Absolutely. And there are more and more GPs now who can give all the advice that you you eventually got you can actually get that in general practice these days as well so gps are gps are amazing at catching up on stuff that they didn't realize they didn't know and they're all learning at about 100 miles an hour at the moment with it all so don't don't necessarily i would just say to listeners don't necessarily think their gps don't know they you'd be surprised what the gps are learning at the moment they're 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 on it basically yeah, and it's worth um, asking which, um, from our last podcast, which one in the practice, that was the word I was looking for, um, in the practice is kind of specialising in that because, there were, you know, it's likely that someone will be. So thank you so much, Dr. Jane Davis. It was a real pleasure talking to you. And thank you to all of you for listening. And also do hit like and subscribe. It really helps other people to find us. And thank you to the wonderful radio facilities who sponsor this podcast. Till next time. Bye. 